Let's play a simple guessing game. Imagine that you had a 5x5 five five grid. We are going to be working cooperatively with one another. Your task is simple. Choose any of these cells. You win if it is the most commonly chosen one. I want you to think about that for a moment and simply type a single letter and a single number into the comments section below and try to guess what is going to be the most common answer among all of the people viewing this game. But don't hit the submit button yet. We're actually going to be playing this game multiple times. Instead of having this 5x5 five five grid, in the next round, imagine that we had a 4x4 four four grid. Same question. Your goal here is to choose the most commonly chosen cell among everyone else who's playing the game. What should you pick? Once more, type that into the comments section below, but do not yet hit submit. We're going to play this a third time. Same question on this third game. Choose any cell. You win if it is the most commonly chosen one. Which should you choose? Type that below, but do not hit submit because we're going to be playing this a fourth time. And in the fourth time, the grid looks like this. Once more, type in any cell into the comments section below and you will win if it is the most commonly chosen cell among all other people who are submitting answers. While you are reviewing your choices, check out some of these cool books that I've written. Your hint for today is to apply Nash Equilibrium, a topic I cover in Chapter 1 of Game Theory 101, The Complete Textbook. Are you ready to proceed? I do hope that you have submitted the comments below because I'm going to enjoy viewing them and see if they match my expectations. These questions are tricky to some degree because there is no one single right answer, and yet sometimes there is a single right answer. Let me explain what I mean. Let's go back to that 5x5 five five grid. For example, a1 is a reasonable decision to make. Imagine a hypothetical conversation between two people playing this game. If the first one were to express that A1 is the best choice for this game, the second person might think to themselves that they should also choose A1. After all, the goal is to match. But if the second person thinks that, that's going to make the first person definitely want to choose A1, which reinforces the second person's decision to follow up with A1, which reinforces the first person's original decision, and so forth. This is the basic idea behind Nash Equilibrium. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If one person thinks that this is going to happen, that makes the other person want to follow through with what they were thinking about doing which makes the first person want to follow through, which makes the second person want to follow through, and so forth, with infinite regress. The problem here, though, is that it doesn't just apply to A1. We could have that same conversation about B1 just as easily, or C1, or B3, or D4, or A5, or e5. Any of these squares, in fact. This turns out to be a central problem of Nash equilibrium. There may be more than one, and when there are multiple equilibria, it might not be clear which of those equilibria the players should coordinate on. And yet, in my experience, despite there being 25 reasonable solutions to this game, Players tend to coordinate on a single one much more often than the others. C3. Is that what you chose? 
The reason that people tend to choose C3 is because it's more focal than the other possibilities. C3 is the center of the square overall. It's basically a bullseye. And as a result, it's tempting to choose that equilibrium over all of the other otherwise reasonable equilibria that are out there. But that's just the first game. What about this second game with only 16 squares? You might think it should be easier to coordinate here. After all, there are only 16 squares, and before there were 25. And yet, I tend to see people struggle with this one much more than the previous one. The reason is because of that center square thing. You would be tempted to choose the center square when there are 25 squares and you have a bullseye. There isn't that same sort of focal square here in the center. Because there isn't a single square that is in the center. B2, C2, B3, and C3 all touch the center, but themselves are not the center. This causes a bit of a coordination crisis. And what ends up happening is that people tend to choose the top left square the most instead. A1 here. But they don't choose it as often as people choose the dead center of the 5x5 five five square. The final two puzzles show how any one coordination system can be fleeting. The third puzzle was exactly the same as the previous one but just had D3 filled in as red. Think about what that does, though. There are now 15 normal squares and one red square. The red square stands out and would be obvious to anyone looking at the grid. Because others will also recognize this, that actually incentivizes you to choose it. It becomes the focal square because it is different than the other squares now. It's a similar story for the final puzzle. If you just have someone tell you before the game begins that B4 is what they're planning to choose, then B4 becomes focal. So I would expect a lot of people to choose B4 here, just like I expect a lot of people to choose D3 in the previous iteration. This is also a great example of how cheap talk can be useful. A cheap talk message is something that you can't inherently verify, so that we don't know for sure that this person is actually choosing B4. It's also free to lie about, and doesn't change the options that anyone has available to them in the future. That's why we call it cheap talk. It's easy to lie about, and we can't really tell immediately if you are lying. But because our incentives are aligned here, I would want to listen to someone who's telling me ahead of time that they're planning on choosing B4. If that's changing our frame of reference to think that B4 is now focal, then there's no reason that the person would want to lie to me about the initial decision to announce B4 as the focal square. Cheap talk doesn't always work out effectively, but it is comforting to see it work out here. Did your answers match what other people have said below? I do hope that you submitted them because I am curious to see if they match what I have seen beforehand, or if doing this online in a video might be different than the other experiments that I've conducted. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Take care.